What do you think is the greatest threat to your dweller on the threshold? Shout it out. I'll tell you when I hear it. Fearlessness. The word. The word is, is getting there. What? Challenge. What's the greatest threat to the dweller on the threshold in you now? Somebody said Christ. That's getting there. Who else? What else? Are you all through? Or are you going to offer me some more answers? <laughs> you don't have it yet. What? Getting cast out. Okay, well, I'm glad I asked the question. <laughs> Most of your responses are metaphysical. And uh, metaphysical means beyond the physical, and it usually deals with thought forms and ideas, but it doesn't deal with action. You see, your soul is not a threat to the dweller on the threshold unless two things happen, that the soul sees through what it is and then has the ability to conquer it and cast it out. So the dwelling on the threshold really doesn't, doesn't, isn't ultimately challenged by your soul or, quote, the light or the truth. These are metaphysical abstracts. The truth isn't truth unless it's incarnate. Light isn't light that's going to bother the dweller unless it's directed to the dweller. So what it comes down to is the greatest threat to the dweller on the threshold is the living teacher or the embodied guru. Because the guru is guru because God has sent the guru to embody the word, to embody the I am presence. The I am presence is the word because the name of the I am presence is I am that I am. So the one who embodies I am that I am is the greatest threat to the dweller on the threshold because that one has the power to cast it out. And this is why you have a living master. Now the greatest threat to your dweller may be El Moria or Saint Germain or the master of your choice. But you have to realize that we have a messenger and an office and a mantle of messenger because that one embodies the authority of the ascended masters and can wield it in your defense. We are approaching the moment when I will be making clearance calls for the removal of anything and everything the great law will allow to be taken. The law only allows that to be taken, which you surrender and are willing to let go of. The problem is that most people do not understand what is the dweller on the threshold. You know it's the point of the carnal mind. But the dweller on the threshold is far more insidious it is reptilian by nature. It occupies uh, uh, the, the, uh, both the land and the sea, the physical and the astral body. It probes the mind. It works as the carnal mind. But it is like the subconscious and the unknown force. You'll pardon this parallel, but it is very apt. It's like waking up one morning and finding that, that you have terminal cancer whose tentacles have spread through all your organs and all your body and there's nothing that can be done. That is how the dweller on the threshold is. It invades the mind and affects your thinking process. But at the same time, it colors your ability to perceive your own thinking process objectively. So you may have a host of delusions that are not really real within your mind, but you don't know that they're unreal, and therefore you haven't identified the dweller. You have not really identified what is uh, to be cast out. And it's like not identifying a cancer that is already spread. You don't know it's there, so you think it's you. Whatever is in your body, you consider to be yourself. So a foreign invader can invade that body, 
practically take you over, destroy conscious existence, uh, and it's all over with before you even know that you've been had. And that's how the dweller on the threshold is. Now, who is the threat to that dweller? The one who identifies it and is willing to wrestle with it. Moria is willing to wrestle with your dweller, but he is barred from entering this octave by cosmic law unless you ask him to enter and compel him and direct him specifically into the condition of consciousness of the dweller. Well, the dweller is an all-encompassing word, so let's say a mental cancer would be one aspect of it. If you can't name the problem, you can't cure the disease. So in other words, the guru becomes the physician and the teacher and if you have someone in embodiment who has that mantle, that person, by your placing yourself as a student, by your free will putting of yourself before that person in that, in that relationship of Guru Chila, that guru can come along at any hour and say, this has got to go and expose your human creation, wrestle with it, bind it, and be willing to receive on the return current of that exchange, the hatred of that carnal mind. Everyone's carnal mind, until the point they balance 100% of their karma and are Christ incarnate, hates the guru, hates the embodied teacher or the word incarnate more than any other factor in the universe because it is the one who has the authority to move in when that authority is given by the chila and to take the disease, to remove the cancer, to bind the carnal mind, even when the individual does not know that he is so diseased or what problem he has. So if you put yourself in a relationship of trust to me, that authority is upon me to make the call for the binding of your human consciousness. I must, however, enlist your cooperation by giving you a teaching that exposes the condition, the properties, the characteristics, and the symptoms of that dweller. And the most effective surgery that is performed is when you say, I see what you have been telling me and I recognize I have allowed this to fester and foment in my consciousness and I'm ready for it to go. And that doesn't just mean a passive readiness, come now, mother, and just scoop this thing out of me and take it away. It means I will actively engage myself in displacing this tumor with the right consciousness, the love flame, the heart of the Almighty. And that takes the work of the ages of the recreation of Christ in your temple by you and the the calling for that Christ, the living of the path of Christ. In other words, it takes all the conditions that we read yesterday in the book of John, the obedience and the love to that person. So I am not soliciting chilas in, in, by way of saying this. I have many, many more chilas than I can even deal with on the face of the earth in, in a, a matter that I consider personal and actively engaged with. And uh, I have never had any desires to either expand my movement or expand the circle of disciples. Uh, the reason I'm telling you this is so that you understand what is the mantle given to me by Padma Sambhava and why Saint Germain had to have someone in embodiment with the authority of Guru because this is what must be done in pre preparation of yourselves for the crucifixion, the resurrection and the ascension. You can't pass the initiation of the crucifixion if the prince of this world comes and finds something in you. So the interaction and interchange with the one person who is likely to perceive, expose, bind, and cast out that dweller and has the authority from God to do so, that is the one that the dweller fears most and is threatened by most. Therefore, that one, that untransmuted portion of oneself, when one approaches the path of discipleship, contains all the doubts, all the fears, all the problems, and especially the hatred. And what it is, it's the hatred of the parts of God. God the Father is hated by the dweller, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Mother. Whichever one of those persons of the Godhood I might be representing at the moment of the casting out and the challenging of it, that is where its venom is placed. Now, as we have said before, to a certain extent in your life, you are guru with a lower letter G, 
In other words, you are teacher and you have the authority to be the teacher of someone, even if it's just your own children or somebody that's beneath you professionally. So there is inevitably going to be in your life a situation where you either have greater preparation or seniority or experience and you find in your care someone that you must be responsible for, give direction to and even correct. And you will have the experience of the animosity and the reaction of the carnal mind or the dweller the first time you raise your voice and say, let's say you're, you're taking roll call and at work. Uh, you were five minutes work, late to work today, so and so, you know, you're supposed to be in on time. Just that is enough to arise the absolute ire of the dweller on the threshold because nobody likes to be told anything by anybody else in this world and especially not by someone that they don't think is any better than they are. You probably tolerate me because I'm wearing the mantle and because I have a little experience on the path. But uh, I have seen situations where for one reason or another I was in the midst of a crowd and I was not recognized and um, I gave a direction like let's walk in this direction or let's do this and let's do that and nobody bothered paying attention to me at all, you know. <laughs> they were just doing what they felt like doing and because nobody, somebody called nobody was saying it, it didn't make a particle of difference. And then all of a sudden somebody recognized, oh mother, it's you, you know, and then they all decided to do what I suggested. <laughs> So by the grace of God, the mantle of the brotherhood becomes the authority that tames the carnal mind and by the momentum and the faith you have in the dictations and the teaching, you stop and listen. So at some point of your soul's oneness with Christ, you have determined to put down that reaction of the carnal mind and listen. And some people listen for a few months. Some people listen for a few years and some people listen longer. Depending on the point at which I step on the toe of that dweller and the soul is so aligned with that dweller, so integrated, meshed with it, that it feels threatened and it says thus far and no farther, I'm not going to listen to this woman anymore because she's not telling me the truth. I'm going to listen to Jesus Christ only or Saint Germain only or Almighty God only and that's the point of the parting of the way. You're no longer my teacher. That's okay. That's everybody's free will and everybody's right to do that. There's a point at which you decide what's inside of you is louder and clearer to you than what I'm saying. Well, ultimately, I'd like to see everyone responding only to their own Holy Christ self because obviously I can't live people's lives for them. And that's the whole point of the teaching. Your own Christ discrimination, your own Christ self is supposed to be your teacher and the messenger is the messenger of your own guru. And the reason that the dweller fears me more than it fears your Christ self is because you are not actively engaged in the full power and mantle of your Christ self at this point on the path. You're about to become a Christed one, vested with a full authority and godhood of Jesus, but you're not quite there, and you're not quite there because the dweller isn't slain. So in the process of becoming, you are at a very vulnerable point because it's like little children. They never feel like they're little children. They feel like they're grown-ups and should have entitled, be entitled to grown-up decisions and grown-up privileges and grown-up rights. And it gets worse and worse as they get to be teenagers because teenagers are fully convinced that they're adults and you never can make the mistake of calling them children. And so in that frame of mind, as we all remember what it's like to be 14 and 15, we're sure we know everything there is to know and we're totally competent to make our decisions. And so sometimes we make some mistakes in those years and we learn by our mistakes. And that's one way of graduating from Earth Schoolroom. But a better way is to listen to somebody who knows the path ahead, warns of its pitfalls, gives you a map and says this is the way to go. And you go that way out of love and obedience and you accelerate the cycles of attainment. Uh, it's very clear in my life that I could have said to Almoria, I'm going to learn this for myself. Or I could say, I don't know what he's talking about and I don't understand it, but I know he's right and I'll do it and I'll find out why later. And I think that's why I'm sitting here today because of my great love for Elmori and Mark. And there's bound to be a moment in your life when what the guru tells you is absolutely opposite what you think is correct. And that moment of trust, you have to weigh it, you have to decide it. I'm not telling you what to do. Uh, you, need to, you need to make those decisions when they come upon you. But the reason that 
your dweller does not fear your Christ self is because your Christ self cannot act against it unless you give it leave. And if that dweller is still in the process of fooling you as to its identity and you can't see it because you are blinded by its very action in your life, then the only hope you have is for someone to rescue. I am very, very happy when someone helps me solve a problem that I can't see my way through. When somebody delivers me from a very gnarled burden of, of administration or business or financial matters or decisions, thousand and one decisions I have to make. And if I can trust someone to assist me with that, that I know I can trust, either in embodiment or the masters, I'm always delighted to have a savior or a deliverer from areas where I feel I lack expertise. And so it's a question of deciding whether or not one knows a doctor and one can say to that doctor, there's something wrong with me, I don't know what it is, please diagnose it and tell me what to do. Because we have faith in him as a doctor and we don't know, we let him operate, we let him treat us, we let him give us medicine and he says this is what you should have. And uh, it's, it's a confidence you put in someone because they have a background of professional expertise in a situation. And there's one thing I know about the presence of God that is with me, and that is that I know absolutely the, bi the business of training chilas. And I know the carnal mind, and I know what that dweller is, and I will always be learning about God and anti-God, but at this point, I have a lot to offer and a lot to give by way of momentum in this field. Obviously, I'm not infallible in the human sense, but God is infallible. Obviously, in the human, I could make a mistake, but God doesn't make mistakes. So the point of trust uh, comes down to, uh, I suppose, percentages of reliability. Nobody thinks a doctor he goes to is infallible either. No one thinks, absolutely, this doctor will never make a mistake and I'll put my life in his hands. But by a certain momentum of trust, we say, well, he knows better than what I know, and I need a professional, and I can't do it myself. So we are at the point in our chilaship at the end of Summit University when initiations can accelerate. They can and do come with tremendous impact and power. And the point where I'm going to do your clearance calls and burn those letters in all three levels, that is the point where you are integral to the process and should have gone before me already with a great God determination to bind the dweller on the threshold that opposes the teacher. The teacher represented in myself, only represented. I am not the teacher. God is the teacher, the Christ self is the teacher, the masters are the teacher. I hold the repository of that teacher's vibration and the authority or the mantle for you and for those who desire it. The real and ultimate teacher is your Christ self. So I'm here to shorten the distance between your soul and your Christ self and to assist you in that oneness. I know by long experience and because God has taught me what stands between you and that union. All of Summit University is designed to give you that perspective, that objectivity, that insight to look at those things within oneself that perhaps formerly were overlooked, suppressed, or very subjective and very much clouded over. So the teaching that I want to bring to you, which El Moria gave me recently for the staff and uh, for those who want to accelerate, is that each one, if he really wants to make progress, should cast out the dweller on the threshold of the hatred of the guru or the hatred of the mother and then you can list all your gurus you can list Sana Kamara, Gautama Buddha, Le Jesus and Kathumi, Maitreya, El Moria, Lanello, especially your Christ self, especially the mind of God. I would say that's the most prominent and activating force deterring you. It's not just the dweller it's the category of dweller that is the hatred of the liberator, the hatred of the one who comes to deliver us from our self-imposed darkness. And the further teaching that Moria gave me on this is that
That is the coloration or the mask or the vibration of the beast of the synthetic self, hatred of the guru. That's its foremost and most prominent quality. And this is why uh, there is so much in the world today and has been for, for centuries, but today it's very prominent, rebellion against authority. The normal course of authority that has to exist in civilization. There are some people that no matter who it is, they want no one telling them to do anything. And that really is the ultimate authority of the fallen, angel, of the fallen angels against God himself. So we have to analyze who is in charge of us and, and determine whether it is Christ or Antichrist. But the automatic rejection of any authority means the breakdown of society. It means anarchy. You know the term anarchy. There's nobody uh, that is respected to govern. Every man governs himself. Every man is a law unto himself. And society cannot exist in that situation. The masters consider that the offices of authority in society in towns, town government, boards of education, police, armies, and so forth, must exist even if they are filled by the wrong people because the very framework of government must continue. And if the people do not like who is over them, the United States government and constitution gives them the right for change, for a lawful change by the electoral process or by the mandate of the people or by the press, the freedom of the press that allows uh, one to expose uh, individuals that are in power. So the binding of the dweller on the threshold of the hatred of the guru and of the mother becomes the removal of a block really to your own Christ self. But it can remove that resistance to the call I will be making within a very few days uh, for the clearance of everything you write in your letters or have written. So I think it's only fair that you realize that Almoria's point is that so long as that substance remains in you, it is a focal point for the anti-guru of the whole planet and for the cosmos, which means that we're working against ourselves. Well, if we have to wait till our karma is balanced in order to be rid of the hatred of the guru, what are we going to do for the next hundred or several hundred years? Moria says is a very simple solution. What you realize is that every 24 hours you give this call three times for the binding anti-guru, the anti-holy Christ self, the anti-mother. You can name the anti-Elizabeth Clare prophet, the anti-Markel prophet, the anti-Moria. Name anything you want to name. And he says if you will do that once in 24 hours, he will bind and cap that dweller for that 24 hour period and it will be as though it doesn't exist and it will not be able to become a focal point for the antichrist of the planet to anchor through you and uh, to do those things which you would rather not do and rather not find yourself be the instrument of. Now that's a tremendous dispensation and that shows the sponsorship of El Moria as the guru. El Moria is doing that that very thing for you by his attainment and authority of his love of the guru, the universal presence of God as guru, and his love of you and respect of your office of chila. The second thing you can do the casting out the dweller of is, is the opposition and the hatred of the office of chila because the world hates the chila and you don't want any hatred of that residual in yourself or you'll magnetize it to yourself. Now this is a great law of attraction and it works in every which way. If you attract to yourself accidents or sicknesses or diseases or whatever, whatever you see coming to you and, and getting into your world from the outside, you have to look inside yourself because that's the guru showing you by experience what's left and residual of the dweller. So if you are prone to this or that, you must look for the vulnerability in yourself. You must say to yourself, I must have a negative anchor point of this positive energy that's aggressively directed at me. And you cast out that aspect in your own dweller and in the planetary dweller and the momentums of that planetary dweller that continually seem to hit you in this weak spot. And that way you will be tackling the most serious problems of the dweller on the threshold right up front on a daily basis. So this, this removal of 
and ceiling of that portion of the dweller that hates the teacher is like the law of forgiveness. When we call upon the law of forgiveness for a certain action we have taken, and when we have not really balanced the karma of that action, if God decides to forgive us, he takes this bundle of karma and he sets it aside and he puts it on his cosmic shelf. And he says, okay, I'm going to seal that in the violet flame. I'm going to cap it. And you're going to go off free from the weight of this. And free from it, you are expected to pursue the path of discipleship and attainment. And when you have enough light and enough attainment blazing in your aura, I'm going to take this off the shelf and put it back in your aura. And at that moment when I do this, it will become your own initiation to overcome and get past that substance. And at that moment, you will be required to forgive others as you forgive yourself and to forgive yourself as you forgive others. Because that karma that comes back to you off the shelf in your aura may be your condemnation of someone else's sin. And it may be combined with the record of your having committed the identical sin in the past. And you will be tested on the formula of forgiveness, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in the exact manner that you treat that substance when it comes back to you, and you have the authority of Christ in you now and the teachings of the masters to challenge it, so will it be meted unto you in terms of your own record. And this is one of the tests that people do not pass along the way of Christhood. They lack the forgiving heart. They do not forgive one another, they do not forgive themselves, and they will never forgive me of any transgression, known or unknown, that may come upon them. And so their absence of forgiveness of any part of life means that that burden of karma that got set aside while they could learn the teachings is back upon them and they will have to have the full momentum of their own being to transmute it. And if they haven't forgiven it in anyone else, no amount of violet flame that they invoke will dissolve that record because that record must be dissolved on the basis of their forgiveness of others. That's the requirement of the law. Not that they be thrown into boiling oil or be thrown to the lion's den or go through some kind of calamity. The law requires forgive and you shall be forgiven. So love becomes the fulfilling of the law. So if we are on the path of chileship, we learn the law, we find out all these wonderful things about God, we must take care that we do not come to the place where our spiritual pride in our newfound knowledge and attainment, all the light we now have in our chakras, makes us look down upon lesser creatures and become, instead of more loving and more forgiving, actually more brittle and less tolerant. The point of forgiveness on the path is necessary. And you make a distinction between the act of forgiveness and the tolerance of sin or evil. You do not tolerate evil or sin. You challenge it. You go to the heart of it. And you realize that that very sin itself has become the dweller on the threshold, the beast, the cancer, that has taken over someone's body. You don't condemn the smoker, you bind the smoking entity. You don't condemn the marijuana addict, you bind the marijuana entity. Well, it works for every phase of life. There's some things we find it, it's easier to forgive because we're objective. We realize people are victims. And then we get into those gray areas where we lose sight of the difference between the sin and the sinner, and pretty soon we are heaping condemnation upon people instead of being the good shepherd that saves them from the wolf. So if you do not forgive life impersonally and personally, forgiveness will be withheld from you day by day in the final judgment and specifically in the call that I'm going to make for your clearance. So I draw these two things to your attention so that you will have time uh, for sobering thoughts about your own psychology and whether or not you are putting up a resistance to Maitreya who will come for this clearance. I would like you to realize that, that forgiveness itself 
the active flame of forgiveness is an impersonal fire, a violet flame of intense love that you hold in your heart toward life. When I invoke daily the flame of forgiveness, I do not qualify it for certain people, nor do I withhold it from certain ones that I think are unworthy. I just am forgiveness. I walk around as forgiveness. I have a forgiving attitude. It's a be attitude. I leave to the mighty I am presence and Christ the Lord to direct that forgiveness where it is due, just as I leave to them the direction of this dweller call. So I think that if you ever entertain any confusion, for instance, how can I forgive Hitler? Well, you don't forgive Hitler. You direct forgiveness into the entire situation and it seals you from, from his energy being upon you. You don't tolerate or condone his actions. You don't approve of the tyrants. You don't approve of Andropov. You don't approve of the KGB and their murders or those unfair things that are done by our government to our own people. But the vibration of condemnation does not live in your breast, nor does hatred. You have the maximum momentum of love and freedom. You make the call. The white fire of God goes into it. You discriminate, you know right from wrong, you say this is not right, this is not just, I demand the judgment, and the judgment is a fire that will consume the evil, the evil work, and ultimately we know the law, it consumes the evil doer if he does not repent of his sin. But when, where, and how is the Lord's business? So the real disciple of the Almighty does not harbor hatred. He harbors the ruby ray, and that's what David spoke of in the psalm when he said, I have hated thee with a perfect hatred. That's the most amazing statement of David. He understood the ruby ray. He understood that that hatred was an all-consuming fire of the very vibration itself of the enemy that would not allow it to manifest in his life and that would challenge it when it did evil. I think that this particular consciousness is the one that ought to separate the chilas of the Great White Brotherhood from every other religion.